Okay, so this video is going to be on um, the first Seedorf theorem. Uh, so let me just write that title. The first Seedorf theorem. And the first Seedorf theorem is a very, very useful little theorem in finite group theory. And it's very useful um, in the classification of finite groups. So you give me an order and work out an order that you want your group. So say you want to know all groups of size 8. Uh, well the first Seedorf theorem is very very helpful in helping us um, list all the groups of order 8 and in proving that there are no more than what we have listed. Um, so it's very very important. Uh, it's comparable to Lagrange's theorem in its importance. Um, having said that, um, it's not comparable to Lagrange's theorem in the uh, in how you prove it. Uh, the proof to Lagrange's theorem is pretty nice. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. The proof of the first Seedorf theorem is not trivial. It is long and complicated. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to firstly discuss the first Seedorf theorem, what it states. And then we're going to prove it, and the proof is going to take quite a while, and we're going to have to prove lemmas before we prove the first Seedorf theorem, etc, etc. So it's it's an ugly proof. Um, okay, so um, the first Seedorf theorem then, the, because this the actual theorem is beautiful. Uh, so if you have a group, let's say G is a group, a group, a finite group, I should say, finite, um, then G has some order some finite order, so n is just an element of the natural numbers. Um, and basically, what can we do with natural numbers? Well, we can factorise them. We can factorise them into their prime factorisation. So, just a little bit of a reminder, prime factorisation. So, for instance, 48, uh, let's do its prime factorisation. Well, 48 is 6 times 8, and 6 is 2 times 3, and 8 is 2 cubed. So the prime factorization is 2 to the power of 4 times 3. Uh, so what we're doing is we're splitting it into its prime components all multiplied together. So let's do another example. Uh, let's do 55 is equal to 5 times 11. So those two are both primes and you cannot split it into any more than that. Um, right, so in the general case, the order of a group G can be split into some Euler product i is equal to 1 to some n of pi and we'll assume that the pi's go in order of size so p1 is the smallest prime so in this case 5 or in this case 2 uh, which is a, in, the, in the product and this just means product rather than a sum in case you're not familiar with that uh, symbol and then each prime will be raised to some power, won't it? To some um, m, can't use n again, m, and that m will be specific to the i. So um, in this case, our Euler product would be uh, i is equal to 1 to 2 of pi mi, and pi will be given by, well, it would be p1 equals 2, and p2 is equal to 3, and mi, in this case, m1 will be equal to 4, and m2 will be equal to 3, and that's what 48 is equal to. Uh, so this is just the most general way that we can write this. And the first Seedorf theorem is that, and I should write it, that there exists a subgroup of G of order P to the I, M I, for all i, um, for all i is in this, you know, in this uh, product. Uh, so in this case, i runs from one to two. I don't mean for all i as an element of the real numbers. I mean for all i that are that is involved in this product. Uh, so in the case of forty-eight, there will exist a subgroup of size two to the four. I will exist a subgroup of size sixteen. There will also exist a subgroup of size three. Note the Seedorf oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, what did I do here? No, M2 is not equal to 3, M2 is equal to 1 in that case. I'm very sorry for that, um, if that's confused anyone. Uh, so this is 3 to the power of 1. Um, so the Seedorf theorem 
do not confuse the seed of firm. The seed of firm does not tell you, the first seed of firm does not tell you that it has a sub, uh, subgroup of size 2. It does not say that any sub, any group has a subgroup of size any prime that divides it. It's the prime raised to this power, this m. So um, that's what the first seed of theorem tells us. There will exist a subgroup of size 16 and size 3 in a group of size 48, no matter what that group is. And this works for any finite group. OK. So that's the first seed of theorem stated. So now we're going to move on to the proof. And before we move on to the proof, we have to prove a little lemma that comes before it, because we're going to use it in the proof um, of the first seed of theorem. Uh, and it is, um, and you could sort of slot it in, in within the proof, but it will make the proof even longer than it already is, and even more complicated. So we're firstly going to have a little lemma. A lemma. And the lemma is, and if you know this lemma, then you can probably, you know, skip ahead, um, that if G is an abelian group, if G is a finite abelian group, a finite abelian group, abelian group, and abelian just means commutative, um, finite abelian group, then, uh, oh, and with order n, order n, so n is just the order, the number of elements within the group. And p is a prime number, prime number, which divides n, n, i.e. p divides n, um, then there exists um, a subgroup a cyclic subgroup indeed of size p. So actually this is the stronger version, the version that you wanted to believe the Seedolf theorem was. That the Seedolf theorem, uh, and this is when I first heard the Seedolf theorem, this is what I thought it meant, that it had, uh, it had, that it meant that a group had a subgroup of size any prime which divides its order. But in fact, that is not true for any general group. Uh, but it is true in the case of abelian groups. So we're going to prove this stronger theorem in the case of abelian groups, which is weaker in the fact that it only works for abelian groups. Um, so how are we going to go about proving this? Well, we're going to do a proof by induction, which is my favorite type of proof. Proof by induction. By induction. Okay, so, well, firstly, so, you know, well, firstly, let's check, check what's the first step in an, induct in an, induction, an inductive proof. You check the case that n is equal to 1. So there is only one group of order 1, it's the pretty trivial group, uh, which is, you know, you have one element, which we'll call E, and it composes with itself to make E. That's all it can compose, because the first axiom of group theory is that the composition has to be closed. Um, so this is some abstract composition. So this we could call it Z1, C1, the identity group, I don't care what you call it. It's the group of N of order 1. So, this is an abelian group. It's a bit trivial, but it is an abelian group. Abelian group. Um, so, and the only number which divides it, I know it's a bit of a sort of grey area where the 1 is a prime number. The reason 1 isn't counted as a prime number is because all of the theorems in an analytic number theory uh, break if 1 is a prime number. And so you have to write, this theorem is true for all prime numbers except, except 1. And basically people got fed up of writing that, so they changed it so that 1 was no longer a prime number, so that all the theorems of analytic number theory would look prettier. But in our case, 1 is a prime number. Uh, well, no, it's not a prime number. But 1, as far as this theorem is concerned, we're counting 1 as a factor. So, and we'll, and we'll do it in the case of n is equal to 2 as well, um, just to sort of assure you that it works, uh, because it is a bit of a grey area whether 1 is a prime number. Um, so, um, in this case, there is a subgroup of order 1. 1 divides the order of the group, and the subgroup is itself, uh, so it works in this case. 
So that's check n is equal to 2, uh, just to, it doesn't really matter, but we'll check n is equal to 2 just because, just to make it cleaner. Uh, so e, e, and then we'll have another element 1, or we could call e 0, which is more usual. There's only one group of order 2, which is z mod 2, so the cyclic group of order 2, 1. Zero. Uh, you can prove that to yourself because you have to have an identity element and uh, one composed of one. The only other thing you could do is make this a one and you can very easily prove that that is not going to form a group. Um, so uh, this is the only group of order two, only group of order two, of order two. Uh, so the order of the group is two order of g is equal to 2. So what's its prime factorization? Its prime factorization is 1 times 2. So you could count that 1 is a prime, and of course there is a subgroup of size 1. There's a subgroup of size 1 in any group. And there is also a subgroup of size 2, which is the whole group. So it works in the case of n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 2. Right. So, now what's the next step in this proof? Well, let the order of the group be some arbitrary number n. So it's some arbitrary number now. Uh, it, it, it's not 1 or 2, we've checked 1 or 2, it's something bigger. Now, if n is a prime number, if n is a prime, prime, then the group is cyclic. It's cyclic. There is only one group of order, a prime, which is z mod p. And in this case, and in this case, the order of the group is equal to 1 times p. And in both cases, there's a subgroup of size 1, uh, the trivial subgroup, and there's a subgroup of size p, the whole group. So there's the improper subgroup and there's the trivial subgroup. But they, it still satisfies the theorem then. Any prime which divides the order of the group has a subgroup of that size. So we're done. We are done if it's so. We are done. So we may assume, may assume n is not prime, prime because if it is a prime, I've already proven it to you. Um, we also, we also can assume g is not cyclic because. Uh, because, that's the upside down therefore symbol, because if g is cyclic, g is cyclic, i.e. i dot e, g is equal to z n, um, then there exists a subgroup of size, of order, any um, any um, m is an element of the natural numbers such that m divides n. That is a very simple uh, theorem. So I will quickly prove this little this little bit here. Um, so if you if if g is equal to z n, then the group can be written as the identity element a a squared all the way up to a to the n minus 1, where there are n elements. Now, if n has a number which divides it, I will do this in the context of an actual example so that you get the feel for it, because it's quite difficult to show it in the abstract case here. So if I take, for instance, z12, which is the clock algebra that everyone knows and loves, um, it's equal to uh, 0, 1, Two. So don't be confused there. I used 1 for the identity here, and now I'm using 0 for the identity here, as is conventional in the case of a clock algebra. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So come up with all the factors of 12. So there's a factor which is 1, 2 is a factor of 12, 3 is a factor of 12, 4 is a factor of 12, 6 is a factor of 12, and 12 is a factor of 12. I'm going to show you that there are subgroups of every single order which divides the order of, group, of the group 12 in the case of a cyclic subgroup. And this is going to work obviously in this case, but it works for any cyclic, uh, sub, cyclic group. And I hope when you 
seen the proof, you should be able to get the feel for why that is true. So for instance, if we want a subgroup of size 1, what do we take? We just say, um, we just say we take the identity element. So we uh, take one element out of the whole 12, and that forms your subgroup, uh, a subgroup of order 1. If we want a subgroup of size 2, what we do is we divide the group into 2, and we just take the first two elements of that, so we take 6 and 0. So in the case of 1, what we were really doing is dividing the whole group into 1 and taking the first element. And you can show that that is a, is a subgroup. So 6 composed with 6 is equal to the identity. Oh my goodness, what is 12 doing over there? No. Um, 12, of course, is the same thing as 0. I got a little confused there. Um, so, um, oh, of course, and clocks wouldn't usually have 0. They'd have 12, but never mind. Um, so if you want a subgroup of size 3, then what you do is you divide the group into order three, into into three equal pieces and take the first elements of that. And you can show that um, that's closed under composition. So why is it not closed under composition? What have I done wrong? Oh no, sorry. What have I done here? No, that's not good. Uh, drawn the lines in the wrong place. There and there. Uh, so you should have taken 8 and 4 and 0 for the subgroup of size 3. So if you compose any of those two together, uh, any of those three together, you'll get an element of that. And then for 4, you just divide it up into 4 pieces, and so on. Um, and you're, you're, you can see that whenever you divide it up in this way, you'll always get a subgroup. And it's because, um, it's because what you're really doing is you're taking, you're saying, take the identity, and take, so let's say we want, right, okay, so uh, for an abstract cyclic group, so Zn, and we, wa we want a subgroup of size m, and m divides n, then take uh, the subgroup 1, and then you'll have um, a, what will you have? You'll have a to the n over m, a to the 2n over m, and when you keep on composing it, when you compose it with itself m times, uh, you'll get back to the identity, because then you'll have a to the n, which is the identity, because uh, that's the order of the group. So you'll get, basically, a cyclic subgroup of that order providing m divides n, basically. Um, so we may assume, therefore, we can assume g is not cyclic. Uh, because if it is cyclic, we're done. We've done it. We've shown that there is always a subgroup of size any number which divides uh, the order of the group in that case, uh, not necessarily just a prime. Obviously, it's getting weaker as you make uh, the groups less specific. So you start off with cyclic groups where any number which divides the order of the group, there will exist a cyclic subgroup of that size. Um, then you go to abelian groups where it's only if it's a prime. And then you go finally to um, any old group and you have only have the first seed of theorem. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, a finite group is the fi uh, final condition for that. Okay, um, so we can assume G is not cyclic. So if G is not cyclic, G is not cyclic, pick an element, an element of G, uh, let's call it H, which is an element of G, uh, such that H is not equal to the identity. So, basically, just find me an element in the group that is not equal to the identity, and construct its cyclic subgroup, the cyclic subgroup generated by it. And this is not equal to the whole group, because we've assumed it's not cyclic. So, we'll call this subgroup H. Okay, so you have two options now. Either, either the order... Either... Now, wait, wait, uh, back a step, back a step. Um, 
Okay, so by the Grange's theorem, by the Grange's theorem, the Grange's theorem, theorem, um, the order of H divides the order of the group. Therefore, we can draw a little picture here. So we've got our little, our little box here. This is the whole group, and we'll call this the subgroup H. So imagine it's split evenly, and the uh, fact that I've split it only into four pieces is just arbitrary. Don't take that for anything more than it is. So um, basically, if I write out the order of group of G, the order of H, sorry, must be contained within the order of G. So when I wrote out, and I'm going to get a new piece of paper. Okay, so let's rewrite out the order of G was equal to some Euler product. I is equal to 1 to some n of Pi to the Mi. Now basically, Hi has to be part of this. So let me show you what I mean by that. So take a definite example. Take, for instance, the group of order, a group of order 48. Uh, we got that that was 2 to the 4 times 3. If H divides G, then it has to be part of this. So, for instance, we could have 2 squared times 3, which is four, 12. 12 divides 48. But if it has to do that, then it has to have part of the prime factorization of this. Now, this means, so... We said that P, um, we assumed, um, okay, so if P divides the order of the group, um, then the order of the group is equal to that prime times something else. We don't care what that something else is. Then the order of H can either have P in it, i.e., the order of H is equal to P times, let's say, just something else, where R is some part of S, or H can be equal to Q, where Q is solely some part of S again, uh, i.e. it does not have this P in it. So, these two options, okay, so, if the order of H is equal to P times R, uh, and the order of H is definitely less than the order of G. Well, I never actually stated this explicitly, but we're doing a proof by induction. So what was the step I missed out ages ago? Um, I should have assumed, assumed that the theorem was true. The theorem was true for the order of the group is less than N. So back up here where I said let the order of G equal N, I should have had this step first. I should have assumed that the theorem that there was a, um, a subgroup of order P was true for any uh, group of order less than N. So better late than never, I have um, assumed that it is true. And I'm now trying to prove that if it is true for order of G is less than N, it's going to be true for order of G is equal to N. That's the basis of a proof by induction. Okay, so um, if this is, this is the case, look, order of H is equal to P times R, and the order of H is less than G. So the order of H, order of H is less than N. Therefore, H has a subgroup of order P. Of order p by the inductive step, order p by the by the inductive assumption. We assumed that the theorem was true for all groups of le order less than n. This is a group of order less than n. It has p in its prime factorization. P divides the order of h. The order of h is less than n. Therefore, by the inductive assumption, h has a subgroup of order p. But H is a subgroup of G. Therefore, any subgroup of G H 
group of H is also a subgroup of G. Therefore, dun dun dun, therefore, G has a subgroup of order P. Order P. So we're done. Providing this assumption here, providing the H that the order of H was divisible by P. So what if if the order of H is not divisible by P? This is the one last case we have to now prove divisible by P. Well, well, um, uh, G is an abelian group. We started with G in an abelian group, a finite abelian group. Uh, so, H is a normal subgroup of G because in an abelian group all subgroups are normal. Uh, therefore, we can quotient G out by H. Now, what is the order of G by H? Well, what do we do in a, when we quotient it out? We take the subgroup H, we devise its cosets, and because H is a normal subgroup, the left cosets are equal to the right cosets, so these are all these cosets of H. And basically, if you take any element in, if you pick two cosets, and you take any representative of this coset, and any representative of this coset, compose them together, it will give you an element in a new coset, and that the coset which that element is in is independent of which two representatives you take. So if I took a different representative here and a different representative here, it might give you a different representative here, but it will always give you the same coset. So it forms a group algebra of the cosets. But how many cosets do you have, which is the question of how big is this group? Well, it's equal to the order of the group divided by the order of H, because all the cosets have the same size, which is the order of H. So if we've got this many elements in this entire box, and we divide it by the elements in each of these boxes, then we get how many boxes we've got, which is this. Uh, so, if H, if P is, does not divide H, so if it, P does not divide H, uh, then P must be in in the prime factorization of G by H. Damn it. Of um, G by H, order of G by H. So basically, P must divide G by H. Now, now we apply the inductive assumption again. Oh dear, I've gone a bit down. Um, right, bring this right up. Uh, apply inductive assumption. Inductive assumption. Uh, therefore, um, G, the factor group of G by H has a subgroup of order P. Brilliant. And um, so, what do we now know? We know that there is a coset in here which generates this entire group. In fact, there are p minus 1 cosets because every element of a subgroup of a cyclic subgroup of prime order uh, generates the group apart from the identity, which is H. Um, so basically, I can find a coset in here which, if I take any representative of it and compose it with itself p times, I get back to the identity coset, so I get some element in H. So. There exists a G, is an element of G, uh, which is not an element of H, such that, that's not important, but just for intuition, that's true, such that G to the power of P is equal to an element in H. Now, do not be confused. It's not equal to the identity element, not necessarily. It might, it might, it would be lovely if it was, but it's not necessarily. It's just an element of the identity coset. So it's an element of H. Um, so G to the P, I can find your G is an element of G, which is not an element of H, although that's not important, uh, such that if I raise it to the power of P, if I compose it with itself P times, uh, it's an element of H. Right. Uh, so, um, now, the order of H 
is less than the order of g. Uh, so let's call the order of h some m. Uh, we've used m quite a bit. Um, let's call it some a. That's okay, we haven't used a yet. Um, right, how am I going to explain this? So, if I take this element, which is an element of h, and I raise it to the power of some number, let's have i, then what happens? I'll get some other element of h. And then what happens if I compose it to it again with g to the p? I'll go on and on and on, getting more and more elements of h. And eventually, what will happen? I will have to get back to the identity element. I will have to get back to the identity element before you reach a. If I reached a, uh, then I'm, I've, I'm, in, I'm in luck. I've, g to the p turned out to be a generator of this cyclic group h. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Uh, Basically, what I'm saying is there must exist there must exist an i which divides a because um, um, do, does that have to be true? Yes, I think that does have to be true. I which divides a such uh, and i is less than or equal to a such that g to the p to the i is equal to the identity. Why does that have to be true? Why does that have to be true? Because if it didn't wasn't true, you could just compose g to the p with itself forever and never get back to the identity element. That's impossible because it's a finite group. Every element has to have an order which divides the order of the group. That's Lagrange's theorem. So this element gp raised to some i such that i divides the order of the group h has to bring you back to the identity element. Now, basic index in laws, swap that over, is equal to the identity. Therefore, g to the i has order p. So pick this element, g to the i, and it has order p. So the su subgroup generated by g to the i is a subgroup of order p. Done. We've proven it. Um, we've proven that. What have we proven? We have proven that if the theorem is true, is true for uh, the order of the group, or the order of the group is less than uh, n, then it is true. Is true. For n. And since it's true for 1 and 2, it's then true for 3, it's then true for 4, it's then true for 5, it's true for all element, true for all g, order of the g is an element of the natural numbers. Done. We have proven, therefore, that any abelian group has a subgroup of order any prime which divides the order of that group. Okay, so we're now going to go on. We've done that lemma, that long, long lemma. How long have we done? Oh, I can't see how long the video has gone on for. We are now going on to the first Silov theorem. Silov theorem. Okay, and that lemma was quite nice. It was quite easy, but the first Silov theorem, we're going to do pretty much the same thing. We're going to do a proof by induction again. Proof by induction. So, take the group G. Oh, wait, what am I going to assume? Wait, yes, yeah, sorry. We'll do the proof by induction properly this time. So, uh, let's check that the theorem is true for n is equal to 1. It's a little bit pointless, isn't it? Yes, the theorem has to be true for n is equal to 1. Again, it's true for n is equal to 2. It's trivial to check because the theorem was... The theorem's... Uh, it's the exact same proof we've already done, but... Um, both these groups, are, both the, these cases obey the first Seedorf theorem. Uh, so assume it's true for the order of the group is equal to some arbitrary k. Um, then, uh, wait, sorry, no, don't assume it's true for that. Assume it's true for the order of the group is less than k. Then we need to prove, prove it's true 
for the order of the group is equal to k. So that's what we're heading for. Uh, right, so consider g has a center. Center z of g. So what is the center? The center is a subgroup of the group. Uh, it's the subgroup containing all the elements of the group which commute with every other element in the group. So the center is a subgroup. Um, it's actually a normal subgroup. Uh, and any subgroup of it is a normal subgroup, which is what's they're going to be very, very important in this proof. Um, right then. Okay, so where do we go from now? Right, so. Um, okay, so if... Right, the order of the group. So we have our G. G is a group. And the order of the group, we'll re-express it again, is equal to, okay, the order of the group is equal to some prime to the power of R times S. We want to prove, to prove that, and that this is equal to K, by the way. Uh, we want to prove that, um, that the, um, there, there, that there exists a subgroup of order p to the r. Now, there are two cases. Either this center is a subgroup, so it inherits some of this. So either p divides the center of the group, i.e. the center of the group, the, if we take the order of the center of the group, it has part of this in it, it might have, you know, it might have p to the, you know, it might have p to the u times part of this, but the point is it's got one of the p's in, or p does not divide the centre of the group, the order of the centre of the group, that should be, uh, in which case the order of the group just has part of this in it. Um, now, we're going to take this case first, because this case is easier, slightly easier to understand. Um, if p divides the center, order of the centre of the group, then we apply our lemma that we've already proven, whippy! Uh, then the centre of the group has a subgroup, and that subgroup is Zp. So there is a subgroup of the centre of the group which is isomorphic to Zp. Um, I should have put, you know, it's got a subgroup H, and H is isomorphic to Zp. So it's got this cyclic subgroup of order p in it. Uh, now, now, we apply the fact, the fact that, uh, that what? That, um, that any subgroup of the center of G is a normal subgroup of G. Now, why is that? Well, it's because every element of the centre of G commutes with every other element of the centre of G. So, if I take G as an element of G, of the group G, and I compose it with an element Z, which is in the centre, well, what happens? Z of G commutes with any element G. So, we can, it's the same as GZ, then G... Uh, by associativity, these two can come together, they'll make the identity, so it makes Z. So it's always, always, always going to be closed under conjugation by any element of the group. So, and it's more than that, it's always going to, um, it, every conjugation you can have is going to map uh, the element of, um, the element that it's acting on, onto itself. Um, so it is a normal subgroup. Uh, so this uh, cyclic subgroup of the centre of G obeys this property too, uh, because every element is going to go on to itself, so it's closed under conjugation. Uh, and I'm going to get another piece of paper. Therefore, what we can do is we can take the factor group, um, we can factor out G by our subgroup H, which is this cyclic subgroup of order P. So, what's the order of this resultant factor group? Well, it's p to the r minus 1 times the something else that we had. Now, 
we apply our inductive principle. Our inductive principle, our inductive assumption, rather, tells us what? It tells us that there is a sub, that within this factor group, within G by H, there exists a subgroup of order P minus 1. Uh, our order p to the r minus 1. So we're applying the fact that we assume the first seed of theorem was true for all groups of order less than k. This is a subgroup, this is, sorry, this is a group of order less than k. So, for this, in this case, this must have a subgroup of order p to the r minus 1. And now we use one of the most beautiful theorems that you learn in your first course on group theory. The correspondence theorem correspondence theorem which says that a subgroup of G by H has a corresponding subgroup of G so um, uh, da, 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 let me draw a picture to try and explain it um, so if we have um, if we have H here and we fact and we've split our big group G. G is the whole thing here. And this is our coset, this is our group, sorry, this is our subgroup H. Then we split G into these cosets. And basically what I've said is that within this new group of cosets being multiplied together, I found a subgroup. So let's say it's these four cosets here. And these four cosets, whenever I compose any two of them together, so if, say I compose this one with this one, it will always give you another coset, so say this one over here, which is in this subgroup. Now, it's very easy to understand because um, this, if I look at, now I'm not looking at each of these as being a coset, I'm looking at every single element in all of these four cosets as being its own element. It has to be a subgroup. Why? Because the way the cosets multiply together was you could take any representative of either of the cosets, multiply them together, and it will give you an element of another coset. So basically, I'm saying that if I take any element in here and multiply it with any other element in here, what that corresponds to doing is multiplying two cosets together, and that has to give another coset in here. Therefore, the multiplication of the two elements in the group has to give another element in here. Therefore, this when I look at it as all of the co all of the individual elements in the cosets in that subgroup um, has to be a subgroup of the overall G. Therefore, it has to have a corresponding it has to have a corresponding uh, subgroup in G. In G, and what's the order of that? Well, the order of this was p to the r minus 1, so how that's how many of these little cosets we've got, and there are p elements in each coset, therefore the order of this subgroup is p to the r. Therefore, we are done. Here is a subgroup of order p to the r, is a subgroup of order p to the r, of order p to the r. Bingo. Um, so that's the done in that case. So now we have to go back. We made the assumption over here that P divided the centre of the group. What if P does not divide the order of the centre of the group? If P does not divide the order of the centre of the group, then it gets a little... Oh dear, this pen is ripping the paper. Uh, I'm going to continue using it though. Um, if P does not divide the centre of the group, then we have to go to a bit more advanced maths to prove this. A bit more advanced group theory. We need something called the class equation. The class equation. Which basically says that you can let a group act on itself by conjugation and you can split a group up into its conjugacy classes. So if this is the group G, here we have our group G, and we split it up into conjugacy classes. And there's a funny thing about conjugacy classes, they're not all the same size. Uh, so we split our group up into conjugacy classes, which basically means you take an element A uh, in a conjugacy class, 
and if you conjugate it by every single element of the group, you go through every element of the group and you work out what is G inverse AG, then the set you get is its conjugacy class. And if you take any other element of the same conjugacy class and do the same thing for it, so let's call this B, and you conjugate it by every single element, and you take that into our set, it turns out it's the exact same thing. So every element of a conjugacy class, if you generate its conjugacy class, it's the same thing. So it's quite a nice way to partition up a group. And the proof is quite simple, because B, if it's in the conjugacy class of A, then there exists some G as an element of the group such that it's one of these. So basically what we're doing is we're then saying, uh, now compose it with every single element and that's G bar. So G is now fixed and G bar varies over every element of the group. And this, uh, or this, uh, because G, G bar inverse is indeed uh, G bar inverse G inverse, you can see that this is conjugating it by this G, G bar. And G, G bar, if you go through G, G bar where you have fix the G, and you multiply it by every single element of G bar, then that just generates the entire group back again. Otherwise, uh, the group wouldn't be... Otherwise, uh, G wouldn't have an inverse if that wasn't the case. Um, so, um, yes. So that's the reason conjugacy classes form such a nice partition of the set. So the class equation is basically saying... Uh, oh, but one more thing. There are some very small conjugacy classes which just contain one little element all on its own. So we'll call this element C, in fact. So, which elements are in the conjugacy class by themselves? Well, it's the elements of the centre. If C is an element of the centre of G, not, not the integers, the centre of G, then if you conjugate G inverse CG, by, if you conjugate it by any element of the group, what are you going to get? Well, it, it commutes, doesn't it? So, you're just going to get C. So, the only element that can possibly be in that conjugacy class with C is C. So some elements are on their own, basically. Uh, so, what we can say is uh, the order of the group is equal to the order of the centre of the group. That gets you what? That gets you all these elements that are on their own. Uh, so that's a start, plus the sum of the size of all the conjugacy classes which aren't just one element. Now, what is the size of those? Well, by the orbit stabiliser theorem, uh, we can say that these are the orbits, so it's equal to the order of the group uh, divided by the index, really, of um, the stabiliser of some representative of that coset over all represents over of that orbit rather. So that looks quite scary. What does it mean? It means. For each of these non-trivial, not on a, on my own uh, conjugacy classes, pick a representative. So we could have A for this one. You could pick B, but you pick one representative from each of these. That's there. You take the centralizer of that representative. Now the centralizer is the set of all elements which uh, commute uh, with A. Um, so the set basically. Uh, which, if you had A within that set, well, it's actually a subgroup, in fact. If you had A just within that subgroup, uh, A would be the centre, basically. A would be in the centre, which is why it's called the centralizer of A. And basically, for, the, the, for all of those elements, those are going to map A onto itself, so they are its stabiliser. And then by the orbit stabiliser theorem, the order of the group divided by the order of this centralizer is going to be equal to the size of the conjugacy classes. But if you don't like that, just think that what we're doing is we're adding up all the sizes of these non-trivial conjugacy classes. So it's a pretty trivial equation, in fact. It's saying add up all the sizes of each of the conjugacy classes, and you'll get the size of the group. And to make it easier, some of these conjugacy classes are on their own, are only contain one element, and how many of them are the, the size of the centre of the group? And then there are these non-trivial ones over here. Right, so if P, if P does not divide uh, the, cent the size of the centre of the group, well, what has to be true? G, P does divide G. So what can we say about this? P cannot divide this. If P divided this, then P 
couldn't possibly divide this, because when you add something that P divides to something that P doesn't divide, you get something that P doesn't divide. So the only way that this can be divisible by P, which we know it is, is that P does not divide uh, this thing. Now this is a great big sum of all these sizes of conjugacy classes, which implies that there exists... And I'll get a, it implies that there exists a conjugacy class class with size not divisible by p by p but now that's the orbit use the orbit stabilizer theorem the order of the group is equal to the order of the orbit times the orbit or the size of the stabilizer and the stabilizer, in this case the centralizer, is a subgroup of G. So, now, order does not divide P. Therefore, if we write out the, um, the size of G again, PR times something else, orbit, the order of the orbit can only be, um, can only be uh, an R, where R is part of, no, not an R, because we've got R up there, some Q, where Q is part of the something else. And this must be p to the r times t, where t is something else. So therefore, I have found your subgroup of G, which has p to the r in it. Now what do I do? I imply, the, I use the inductive principle. I say, this therefore must have a subgroup of size pr. And then, uh, if it's got a subgroup of size pr, because it's a subgroup of g itself, therefore g must have a subgroup of pr. So what I've shown you is that g must have a subgroup of pr. That if you have that inductive assumption that it's true for all orders of group less than some k, then it's going to be true for the next one along. And since it's true for 1 and 2, it's true for 3, it's true for 4, it's true for 5, it's true for 6, it's true for all the natural numbers. So that is the proof of the first Seelov theorem complete. Phew.